Hello. Hey, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, Limitations of Lightning panel. Um, I'm Nifty. I'll be moderating today. Um, I'm here with Christian Decker from Blockstream and Renee Pickhart, um, who's a longtime researcher in the lightning space. Um, good morning, guys. Um, do you want to go ahead and maybe give a quick overview of like how what your relationship to lightning is, how long you've been in it, kind of, uh, yeah, just a little background on yourself. Sure, yeah. Uh, hi, I'm Chris. Uh, I do Bitcoin stuff. No, I, <laughs> I, I'm, uh, I stumbled over Bitcoin very early on, started doing my PhD on the scalability of Bitcoin, which eventually led to a system very similar to Lightning. And uh, since I didn't want to sort of break the community, I joined the winning effort. So I'm a win team joiner, and now I work on uh, Core Lightning at Blockstream. And you guys just had a big um, announcement this morning, right, with the Greenlight project. Exactly. Look, Greenlight is our uh, Lightning node as a service offering where we take care of, uh, of some of the management and hopefully enable the vast majority of people to onboard onto Bitcoin and Lightning. Cool. Thanks, Chris. And Renee, what about yourself? Yes, yeah, so I'm usually a recipient of Christian's announcements <laughs> because back in 2018, somebody sent me his blog article uh, when you announced that Sea Lightning has WooCommerce uh, plugin enabled uh, and said, hey, maybe Bitcoin and blockchains might scale and work after all. And I was like, hey, that's interesting. So I read Christian's article about the Lightning Network. Um, and then I read the Lightning Network white paper and the bowls and everything. And I started to get really excited about this technology. And I think since the beginning of 2018, I hardly didn't do anything else. So <laughs> studying what you guys have been inventing and trying to criticize it at some point in time a little bit. Well, criticize and improve, of course. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, so a lot of your research has been lately on how to make payments work better on Lightning, right, yeah. Renee? Like, how would you characterize like, the work you've been doing on the min cost flow algorithm stuff? Yes. So, I mean, one of the problems in the Lightning Network is, is that when you want to make a payment, you have to choose some route through the network. The sender does this. And um, it's kind of comparable to, to the early days of the internet where you didn't have TCP. So you try the payment and it might fail and then you have to like redo it again. And there's this entire question of how do you do this optimally? And uh, with the min cost flow approach, we have um, basically together with probabilistic pathfinding, one of the um, methods that given the current protocol, we can optimally uh, plan payments. Yes. Yeah. Um, so our, our kind of one of the themes we're trying to talk today on the panel is like what the limitations are. Um, where do you guys want to start? Should we start with talking about like payments failing on Lightning? Is that a good place? Um, yeah. Cool. So I recently saw some um, research that I think Sam Wooters from River is going to present where he's showing that payment reliability on Lightning has gotten better. Um, do you guys think that like... Is payment reliability like a big problem? Like, is this something we're always going to struggle with? Um, what do you guys think? Like, I, I think it definitely should be the, the focus of, uh, of most of uh, the developer attention right now because it is the first thing that new users will see when, uh, when trying out Lightning, right? If their first mm -hmm. experience is essentially that, hey, this stuff doesn't work, like 5% out, uh, out of 10, uh, 10 attempts, then... There, that's, that's a very bad experience, and people will probably go back to whatever payment method that they used before. If we can, however, make sure that we have 99, 99.9% .9 uh, success rate, at that point, it becomes way, uh, way more acceptable for, uh, for users to actually use Lightning in the wild. Um, and that's why a focus on developing better routing algorithm, better heuristics about what the network weather looks like uh, are dearly needed and uh, it is just because it is the, the most visible part uh, that, that new users will see. Uh, and that's the part where users interact with before they start learning about this stuff as well. And that's when we can start telling them about the difficulties we encounter performing <laughs> payments. But it shouldn't be their first experience. Yeah, I, I realized a while ago, I had been making this comment to people, kind of in a joke, but half serious, that 50% of lightning payments should fail. Um, and then I realized that most people didn't really understand what that meant. Um, I think I meant 50% of payment attempts should fail, right? Yes. But whenever you're using like a lightning app, the lightning app kind of 
abstracts that away, right? It makes like a lightning application when it's making a payment will make lots of payment attempts under the hood, right? And so it's not necessarily that we want 99.9% .9 of actual payment attempts to succeed. It's just we want there to be like the ability to succeed after you've tried a bunch of routes, right? Does that make sense? Or what do you think, Renee? Like, do you think that we can get to a point where even like the first attempt that someone makes it, that tries to make a payment should work? So, so I think that will hardly be possible without severely changing the protocol. So the way how the Lightning Network protocol is designed is it keeps in mind a certain amount of user privacy. Mm -hmm. And with that, what it means is we don't know how much liquidity is in remote channels that we would like to use. So it's basically like you say, hey, I want to go from Amsterdam to, let's say, Berlin, and you route yourself uh, via Hamburg. But you don't know whether between Hamburg and Berlin there might be a traffic jam. Right? And once you arrive at Hamburg, it says, no, I can't move you forward, so please go back to Amsterdam and try again. So this is the way how the protocol is designed. So payment failures, or at least the failures of attempts, are built in into the protocol. The question is, what can we do about this? Right? One thing that, that a lot of my research was focused on is, let's quantify the uncertainty and let's try to minimize the uncertainty and optimize this, but we only can reach a certain level there. Right, so I think, or I'd like to think that a lot of the improvements that you observed over the years actually are related to the fact that a lot of the implementations implemented the work that I've been researching. But then the next question is, is how can we improve the protocol mm. so that the uncertainty may not even be a problem? Yeah. Do we have like suggestions on that? Like, Well, one, one suggestion that has been circling around, I think, even in, in the early... 2019 is to do redundant overpayments. Mm. So right now what we do is we send out an onion, which is like a payment attempt, and when it fails, it comes back, and then we try the next one, right? This is your 50% chance, right? So you do 50% chance, well, maybe it fails, it goes back, then you do another 50% chance, right? Eventually, statistically, it should arrive. What you could do is you could basically say, well, if I have enough liquidity, let's do five of them concurrently, mm. and let's hope that statistically at least one arrives. But then the question is, if we do it in the current protocol, if two arrives, somebody could claim two payments, and then you would overpay. You don't want to do that, right? But um, with PTLCs, there is a chance to make cancelable payments. So, yeah, there's protocol changes in this direction that are being proposed or being discussed. The question, of course, is how exactly do you need to do them? Mm, that makes sense. So just to kind of give, like, a quick overview of what you said, like, right now in the protocol... If you're trying to pay another person using Lightning, you can only make one attempt to pay them at a time. And on average, just naively, you would expect it to fail 50% of the time, right? Um, so that means there's a lot of time that maybe you're waiting until you finally make a successful attempt, right? Whereas um, there's the possibility, if we change the protocol, where you could kind of do parallel attempts to try to find the correct path, and that would drastically speed up these payments, right? Um, so that's pretty cool, yeah. But we need PTLCs for that, which is something we can add now that we kind of have started adding Taproot to the protocol, which is cool, right, yeah. Um, I think there's another thing around, like, um, payments reliability that we could probably talk about, which is, like, the liquidity, right? Like, getting liquidity into the system. Um, is there enough liquidity to go around? Um, do you guys have any thoughts on that? Or uh, It's... It's probably not, not as much an issue of how much liquidity we have, but how do we allocate it? Um, because it, it, it has a tendency of being very centralized around a, a couple of, uh, of very big hubs, which from a routing perspective is actually not that bad, right? The more, the more centralized the network is, the easier it is to find a path. But obviously we don't want a centralized network because then you start relying on these, uh, on these big nodes. So very much like, like the privacy aspect and the payment success rate aspects, we have two diametrically opposed goals that we sort of try to fit into the, into the Lightning specification itself. And, uh, and we need to somehow find the middle ground that works, uh, that works for our needs uh, best. And the liquidity we have currently in the network uh, is improving rapidly with lots of initi initiatives starting up their own liquidity service providers where you can buy liquidity if you're sort of a leaf in the network. Um, and they stand to make, uh, to make a bit of a return on investment on, uh, on that liquidity that is being provided as well. 
Uh, the question always is how do we allocate, how do we decide how big of a channel we want to, uh, we want to open to such an endpoint. Is this coffee that they're going to, going to be paid today, is that going to be a repeat interaction? Shall we over allocate to a certain amount? Shall we under allocate? Uh, how much do we wait for the channel to be established? How much do we trust the endpoint? And so that, that is a wide open design space that we're still very much uh, uh, exploring. And I have a bit of a smile on my face because we are both academics, right? When we talk limitations, we are talking about exciting new stuff that we can build going forward. It's not that we are saying lightning is doomed. Just wanted to add that as a framing here as well because otherwise this is a very, going to be a very doomy panel. <laughs> no, I think doom is good. Doom and gloom is great. Like, if we don't talk about what the limitations are, I think it's difficult for people to understand kind of like what's going on at like the basic layer that everyone else is trying to build like applications and projects on top of, right? And without a good understanding about kind of where the edges are, um, I think people get surprised and rather not surprise people. I want to get back to this idea about liquidity allocation, right? Because that has like a real cost. Like I think one of the kind of cool and interesting problems with attempting to allocate, you know, Bitcoin into Lightning is, as you were saying, figuring out where to put it, like where in the network should we put it? Who's got enough traffic that it's worth us to like take, you know, if you own Bitcoin and you want to put it into the Lightning network um, so that other people can use it to route, you got to figure out like where can I put it such that people are actually trying to make payments, right? If you put your Bitcoin into a channel and it doesn't get used, well, you had to pay money on chain to end it up there. And then later you're going to have to pay another on chain transaction to move it somewhere else. So in some ways people say that like liquidity on lightning is, um, you know, inefficient that way. There's also like a real world cost in terms of taking up block space to move mm -hmm. allocations, right? So Renee, you had some thoughts about like the block space consumption of lightning and how that impacts scaling. Yes. So, so I want to iterate on what you said, right? There's, there's two separate problems here. One problem is if you misallocate your liquidity as of right now, it's just a cost for you because you might have to close the channel again and you just have to pay some on-chain fees, right? While, while this might be not nice for you, it's not too big of a problem. But once we have like a large usage of lightning, liquidity needs to be reallocated over and over again. And at some point in time, the blocks might become full and then you really run into a problem because, well, then you have the system, the liquidity has dried up, you're trying with pathfinding and payment routing to find the liquidity, mm -hmm. but the routing nodes, they, they need to reassign the liquidity, and if you just have enough of them and enough economic activity, then you might run into this problem. Of course, you can do some transactions where you batch these things and so on and so forth, but by the end of the day, block space is limited, mm -hmm. and this is a certain limit that basically reflects back to what is possible in Lightning. Yeah, I think it's uh, it's very much also uh, an issue of uh, how much information do we do we have available when it comes to allocating funds as well, right? Uh, so LSPs right now all operate on a bit of a secretive formula of, uh, about what they what they want to do, and I think your uh, your initiative, Liquidity Ads, is is an excellent uh, solution for that problem as well. Liquidity Ads are essentially uh, an extension of the gossip protocol that allows you to declare, hey, I have some liquidity I want to sell and others to take you up on that offer. And I think this kind of information sharing that isn't actually going about individual payments, but more on an aggregate level, hey, I intend to perform some payments in the future. I need to, I, I need to get liquidity now is exactly, is solved by such a, such a system where we have an open market. And if there is one thing we know about open markets is that they are very efficient when it comes to, uh, to allocation of, uh, of uh, liquidity, ideal markets, of course. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, I, I, I think we are, we are slowly building up the infrastructure to exchange that information and to make it more transparent and to create a more efficient market as we go along. And I think the same is going to be the case also for sharing information ahead of time when it comes to finding liquidity in the existing channels as well. I'm, remember, uh, I'm remembering your friend of a friend proposal where we essentially just gossiped slightly around, hey, I have this channel, there is, this is my approximate allocation. 
again, there's a bit of a trade-off, right? How much information do we share? How much information do we not share? If I see 13 Satoshis being subtracted on one channel and then an adjacent channel also gets subtracted to 13 Satoshis, I might have an inkling that there is a payment going through there. But if we, uh, if we sort of bucketize the information that we share and make it, uh, make it abstract such that these fine-grained uh, sort of inferences cannot be made, then this might, uh, this might be a way forward to also augment the success rate of, uh, of payments going forward. So I want to address this point that you said that the open markets usually are very good in figuring out problems. Um, I was supervising uh, a master thesis by Sebastian Alcher, and he basically was able to show that the way how we currently do the payment routing is selfish. Mm -hmm. And doing selfish routing means that there is a certain price attached to it because everybody is trying to go through the same juicy channels, and those channels might dry up more quickly. So the fact that everybody is trying to work this open system might actually produce more jam, more traffic, more congestion and more failed payment attempts. Also, the fact that we need something like liquidity ads is actually kind of surprising because, you know, every channel is currently anchored to a funding transaction. Mm -hmm. And you can basically on-chain observe where the liquidity is going in the Lightning Network, who brings liquidity, who uses up liquidity. Um, and I think as a community, there is still a lot of stuff we can figure out what to do with this kind of data and how to utilize this information. Uh, and I see there's a lot of opportunities to improve on this where this is currently not utilized um, at max. Oh, I, I see a couple of master theses coming up here. <laughs> and, and, and that being said, liquidity ads still are useful, obviously, then to, to actually really sell the liquidity, right? But I'm just saying there's other things we could already do within the given protocol. Definitely, yeah. I mean, I think of liquidity ads as like a coordination mechanism, right? Like in most markets, it's about coordination, right? Someone needs inbound liquidity, someone wants to sell Bitcoin that they have available, and so it's just helping those two parties like coordinate, right? Um, so that's kind of one of the cool things with markets is helping, you know, helping people find signals about where liquidity is needed, that's the people that want to buy it and then where people are willing to provide it, you know, and that's how it was through the advertisement. I think there's a couple other like marketplaces that have popped up that try and do similar things. Um, as far as I know, the liquidity ads protocol is the most decentralized one, but there's also like Amboss that has Magma. I think Lightning Labs has like their pool project, um, which does a similar thing, but in a more centralized kind of like market arena place. Um, Christian, I had, a, I wanted to kind of ask you really quickly about like, you know, Greenlight. So Greenlight as a project, you know, how does liquidity work with Greenlight? So Greenlight's this project you guys announced this morning. Um, my understanding of it as a project is that it's really about bringing node infrastructure and making, you know, enterprise grade node infrastructure more available to anyone that wants to run lightning nodes in like, I'm going to call it a self-sovereign manner because you're able to keep your keys and your own device, like so hosted at home. But all of the infrastructure for keeping the node online, making sure that you're responding to payment requests pretty quickly, um, doing all the backups and all the kind of like work to make sure that your node stays online is like abstracted away into the cloud. What have you guys done though to kind of deal with this problem of like each of these individual nodes though is gonna need liquidity? Yeah, so uh, first, first of all, I, I mean, none of this is green light specific, but we sort of try to bundle it together to make it more accessible. Uh, what runs under the hood on, at Greenlight is just a normal core lightning uh, node, and we actually want this to be an onboarding effort rather than, than sort of capturing people into that. So we, we offer, for example, the opportunity for later on exporting your node and, uh, and, and running it on your own infrastructure. And as such, all of the features have to be accessible for core lightning open source as well. Um, what we did do is we, we did bundle up a couple of uh, sort of default options uh, just to make it easier for users that are very new to this, this whole concept of, uh, of running, a, uh, running a node just to give them an option that they can pick by default and, uh, and sort of have a good user experience. And that sort of materializes in, uh, in our integration with the Breeze LSP. So Breeze uh, has been running one of the biggest uh, uh, lightning wallets uh, non-custodial lightning wallets uh, in the open, and they have recently migrated over to Greenlight. And part of, uh, of what we're doing there is we're also using the Breeze LSP as a sort of a way to 
uh, get incoming liquidity whenever you create, a, for example, an invoice. Mm -hmm. So uh, what you do is you create an invoice that has a, uh, a hint attached that they should go through Breeze, uh, Breeze's LSP, and Breeze's LSP knows that they, are, that they should open a channel on demand when there is an incoming payment. Our attempt here is to abstract as much away from, uh, from the user as possible because this complexity is what, will, what might keep us as a niche product uh, with respect to, uh, to the rest of the world. And we really want to enable all of the users to, to onboard into Lightning. And the easiest way for us to do that at the moment, uh, we're just liquidity service providers. And we're hoping to, to expand the list of liquidity service providers going forward as well. Uh, to provide more flexibility to users that might have started learning more about, about the intricacies of, of Bitcoin and Lightning. I, I, I think the fact that this term liquidity service provider or Lightning service provider is being coined shows actually the complexity that is attached to running a Lightning node. Um, if you compare it, for example, with ISPs, almost nobody is their own ISP, right? Technically, mm -hmm. you just need a router and you need to put it in some data center, but it's actually really hard to do that. And I think in Lightning, a similar thing applies. Um, when back in 2018, I discovered your blog article, I thought it's easy. I went to GitHub, I downloaded the source code, I compiled it, I installed it, and my Lightning node was running, right? But I'm a technically sophisticated person. For most people, it's much harder. And then, of course, you only have the software running. It doesn't mean it's running well and it's running properly. You need to manage your channels. You need to manage your liquidity. You need to make sure that your service level agreement is there. And then, God forbid, hopefully, your hard disk doesn't crash. Oh, yeah. yeah. No, no. Database management and backups are sort of the most misunderstood mm. uh, ideas in, in Lightning. Restoring a backup isn't safe in, in, in Lightning, which makes this really, really tricky. Um, but yeah, I think coming back to limitations, I mean, the technical difficulties and technical challenges that people have to overcome are probably the biggest hurdle uh, to, to mass adoption or even to adoption by a larger group, right? We happen to be, all three of us, we, we happen to be techies and, and we actually like the complexity. So it's very hard for us to, to sort of see what, uh, what everyday users might be encountering as issues. And hanging out in, in support chats, that becomes very apparent uh, because, uh, because you spend, I spend a lot of time on Telegram and on Slack on, and on Discord, essentially just trying to help people to, to navigate this complexity. But, but it's also interesting to observe the subtle interactions between the Bitcoin protocol and the Lightning Network. Right, so for example, when we recently had these spamming attacks on, on the Bitcoin network, mm -hmm. some Lightning developers were saying, hey, this is actually great because it um, uncovered a lot of the subtle bugs and issues that we were having. Right, or for example, when we're talking about the open markets, there's a market for, for block space, which is the auction system for fees. Well, I mean, this has a tremendous impact on, on Lightning channels. If you do a force close and, and you have your fee committed wrongly, I mean, yes, nowadays with anchor outputs, this is getting a little bit better. But, I mean, there, there are subtle things that we still need to figure out in order to get this running really securely and properly. But, yes, I'm, I'm arguing, of course, from, like, high demand. Ab absolutely. I mean, and, and, and since you mentioned the, uh, the uh, problem of full blocks we, we recently had with, with the whole ordinals and, and BRC20 token stuff, um, that, that, is, that is very much, I would say, appreciated. Uh, it, it showed up a lot of uh, a lot of assumptions that might not hold all the time, and uh, and showed us where we needed to improve. So it, it, it was a very interesting dry run for uh, for our capability of adapting to changing Bitcoin weather, so to speak. And since you since you mentioned Lightning and uh, and Bitcoin interactions, let's just talk about uh, uh, let's just talk about pinning attacks. That's a very, very subtle uh, interplay of, uh, of the two protocols that we mm -hmm. took years for us, uh, for us to realize that, that there are such attacks. And for me, of course, that, that is very exciting as well because <laughs> it's, there's, there's a new building site I can, I can sort of start building my, uh, my protocols again. But uh, uh, looking from the outside, it, it might look very scary as well. Pinning attacks, there's such a 
un like such a like niche thing i think is a good way to say it like in order to understand like what that is this has to do with when you're trying to close a lightning channel and the mempool may be full or maybe there's someone who's trying to prevent your closed transaction from reaching the miners etc um in order to understand that like problem and those like kind of technical issues around it you have to really understand how the mempool works and it turns out that a lot of people don't really understand how the mempool works um so it's kind of interesting to try and talk to people there, about there that. is there's uh, uh, there's a complexity and then there's an emergent complexity <laughs> yeah. that comes from the interaction of of people and protocols and, and stuff like that and uh, sort of the emergent properties are probably the more difficult ones to analyze but uh there are challenges let's let's solve them <laughs> i was really curious we only have a few minutes left christian but i was curious about like so with greenlight you guys want to get like what's your ambition there for getting like are you guys looking to get like millions of people on the lightning and then how are you planning on managing like if we get millions of people coming into lightning whether through greenlight or through something like the phoenix wallet or another project that rolls out to get a bunch of people onto lightning is there enough liquidity and like block space to go around to get all these people onboarded maybe this will be like our final comment so like yes yeah, so uh, so of course the scalability of a scaling solution is always uh, is always an interesting topic and there seems to be a, a, a common conception that uh, uh, that lightning can get us to 8 billion users and maybe machine to machine payments call it tens of of billions of users and what might be what might be a bit depressing for many people but also exciting for me is that uh, that is by by no means the case right mm -hmm. with lightning we might get to three orders of magnitude so we might be talking millions of users we might be talking tens of millions of users but we're not talking billions right um, and how, do you, for, how do you define user user running their own node or user also using lightning over a custodial service which is currently happening a lot so 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 i I'd, I'd like to take it as constrained as possible and and uh, talk about the self custodial users that actually invested the time to to upgrade their experience and to to do the hard work to to get onto the lightning network uh there are complementary technologies such as fedimint or chamian ecash or all of the all of the more experimental kind of uh things that can extend us way beyond those those pure lightning uh users and those can be part of the solution uh, as well right and we will sort of extend the lightning protocol over time and we will face those challenges and limitations and we will get to overcome them whether we still call it lightning or we call it some some new project name i don't know but i'm very optimistic that uh, that we will make the best use of the limited block space we have of the limited liquidity we have and get us to serve all the people that want to be served i i want to just drop one number if you if you think about let's say 21 million users on the lightning network that would mean that every node could just bring one bitcoin to the lightning network and this shows also how scarce the liquidity might be on the lightning network eventually just one bitcoin that's <laughs> i haven't heard that for a long time cool we are out of time thank you very much y'all and thank you guys cool hey thank, thank you, you. Thank you. We're here at the Bitcoin Amsterdam Live Desk, brought to you by Bitcoin Magazine. I am sitting with Desiree Dickerson, CEO of Thunder Games, and Julian Limiger, CEO of R Relay. And we just heard a great technical talk about some of the current challenges with Lightning. Now, both of you run Bitcoin businesses. Can you tell us a little bit about how you use Lightning in your operations? Des, we'll start with you. Yeah, so um, at Thunder, we um, do a couple of things. The first is we do mobile games with micro incentive rewards um, using Bitcoin. Um, so that's, you know, the first way that we use Lightning, where, you know, there's no other way to send one Satoshi, three Satoshis um, every hour to our users. Um, and it wasn't possible to do with Bitcoin at all until we started um, using it with the Lightning Network. 
That's great. So, Julian, how about you? Are you guys using Lightning yet? Well, currently we mainly use it as a meme. <laughs> so people, uh, our, our community, our users are asking us when Lightning, when Lightning for more than three years now. But actually in the next couple of weeks, we will come out with a very interesting um, announcement in that regard. And obviously it is our goal to really upgrade the experience of our users also to Lightning. So that as Desiree said, like also these instant and basically for free, very small payments and also purchases will be possible. That's great. Really exciting to hear. So, you know, I personally, I know if I have experienced challenges onboarding people to Bitcoin, mostly with the time it takes for them to download an app, get the wallet, set it up, and then receive Bitcoin. So I'm just curious, what are some of the difficulties you've had with onboarding people to Lightning, either personally or with your businesses? For us, you know, there's several, but I think the biggest one is really comes down to UX, and that's really the way you solve it is by having a very product and user-driven organization. I mean, we do games, so people are very finicky, so we do our best to make it a really seamless experience and also really mirror other experiences that they've had in other popular products. Cool. I can only second that. It's, it's really taking away all the complexity from the user. This is your job as a company, right? And the user should just have a very slick and uh, easy, simple user experience. Great. Thank you so much. Now we're going back to the Genesis stage to hear from Balaji about the Bitcoin network state. Thank you, Miami, for the last three years in this amazing city. The whole world shut down, but Miami welcomed us with open arms. We want to show Bitcoin to the whole world. We are taking the conference on the road to set the stage for Bitcoin in a new city. Nashville. Bitcoin 2024 is coming to Nashville in Tennessee, a city that is known as a music and freedom city. Bitcoin 2024 in Nashville from July 25th to 27th.